Lev Vygotsky's theory of cognitive development is often referred to as a sociocultural theory. Lev Vygotsky was born on November 5, 1896. He was born in a small town named Orsh, which was located in western Russia. Lev Vygotsky was the second of eight children born to well-educated parents. His father was a bank manager and his mother upheld the home with an atmosphere of love and care. Vygotsky studied with a tutor in his home for the first few years of schooling and then entered a private all-boys secondary school. In 1913, Vygotsky graduated from his pre-university schooling with honors. His favorite classes were psychology and philosophy. However, he did not study these immediately upon entering the university. Soon after he graduated secondary school, Vygotsky began studying at the University of Moscow. He first enrolled to study medicine, however, he discovered that was not the field for him. He transferred to law and graduated from Moscow University with a law degree in 1917. A few years after graduating from Moscow University, Lev Vygotsky gave a presentation to the faculty of the All-Russian Psychoneurological Congress. Immediately after the presentation ended, he was invited to join the staff of the Moscow Institute of Experimental Psychology. At the Institute, Vygotsky served as a teacher and researcher for nine years. He was an innovative psychologist who made significant advancements in the field of child development. His short career focused on child development, developmental psychology, and educational philosophy. Around the time of his joining of the Moscow Psychology Institute, Vygotsky married and later had two daughters. On June 2, 1934, Lev Vygotsky passed away of tuberculosis. After his death, Joseph Stalin established a ban on the publication of his ideas. During this time, Vygotsky's widow and two daughters kept his manuscripts safe for years. The publications were able to be published in 1953 because of Stalin's death. Throughout his life, he completed 270 scientific articles, numerous lectures, and 10 books before dying at the age of 37. In his theory, he believed that children gain knowledge with the help of others, particularly parents and other skilled adults, called co-constructivism. He believed that children learn first at the social level through interactions with others. Learning happens because we interact with our environment. We do not learn because we have developed. We develop because we learn. He focused on how children develop language and how those skills promote dialogue with others. His beliefs focused around the zone of proximal development, known as ZPD. The ZPD is the area between a child's area of current abilities, the actual development, or I can, and the area where the child is not ready to learn, the higher level of development, or I can't. Tasks that are too complex become frustrating and do not promote learning. The area overlapping is the zone where learning happens. The tasks in the ZPD are the things we can almost do ourselves but still need help from others to accomplish. The key is to aim between these two areas of learning. Think of an Oreo cookie. The top cookie is the easy or boring stuff and the bottom cookie is the too hard stuff. The fillings represents the tasks the children can almost do themselves but need a little assistance from others to complete, the ZPD. This concept of assisting in learning is called scaffolding. Scaffolding is defined as instructionally supported interactions that guide effective learning. It gives the child the support and guidance to learn a new task, just as scaffolding is used by painters to complete their task. As the teaching scaffolding continues, new possibilities and knowledge are learned. Teachers need to build on prior knowledge without making things too complicated. The ZPD should be checked periodically by teachers by solving a problem and observing whether the child can imitate it. They should also begin solving a problem and ask if the learner can complete it. Another way is for the teacher to ask the child to cooperate with another, more developed child in solving a problem. Every child has a different zone of proximal development. Although Vygotsky shared how ZPD and scaffolding are very important in development, he also did not want the psychology of play to go unnoticed. 
This is the time in which a child does not need an adult's assistance or lead, but rather they take the world into their own hands. Imaginative play shapes how children make sense of their worlds, how they learn thinking skills, and how they acquire language. When working with or raising children, you observe them in imaginative play daily, whether the child is playing by themselves and has imaginary friends, or if they are playing with a group in which they are playing house. These are all forms of play. During play, children are creating dialogue, expanding their vocabulary. They are creating conflicts in which they can decide how to resolve. One important thing that should be noticed is that the technology of this world is slowly diminishing the play factor for children. Speech is also a focus of study that Vygotsky wanted his followers to know. He noticed three forms of speech that a child goes through. First is social speech, which is in the early years of birth to age two. Social speech is when the child is talking to the outside world with whatever they can get to come out. Vygotsky was then the first to document the next form, which is private speech. This is directed to the child themselves in teaching their mind to grow and is found important because it is the transition between the other two forms. Lastly, Vygotsky noted that silent inner speech is a form of speech used around the age of seven. Once private speech diminishes, the speech becomes self-regulated and just flows as a natural conversation with one's self would. Quote, inner speech is not the interior aspect of external speech. It is a function in itself. It still remains speech, example, thought connected with words. But while in external speech thought is embodied in words, in inner speech words dies as they bring forth thought. Inner speech is to a large extent thinking in pure meanings. End quote. While Vygotsky's social development theory explains one aspect of development, Jean Piaget's theory offers another perspective. These contrasting theories have numerous differences, but they also have some similarities. First, both theories have a genetic or developmental perspective. Second, both think psychological development involves a continuous interaction among distinct but interdependent functions or processes. Third, both theories view consciousness and intelligence as forms of organization and adaptation. While the theories are similar in some ways, they aren't as significant as the ways in which they are different. Piaget emphasized that intelligence is actually acquired based on own action, and if kids continuously interact with their environment, they will eventually learn, while Vygotsky says that symbolism in history will help children learn. Furthermore, Piaget believed that after a series of development, learning will take place whereas Vygotsky believed that learning is possible before the child's development. In addition, Piaget thought development occurred in stages, while Vygotsky assumed that there are no set of phases. Lastly, Vygotsky claimed that language plays an important role in cognitive development, while Piaget only viewed language as a milestone in development. Piaget believed the child constructs their own knowledge while Vygotsky believed children learn through social interaction and that growth is a collaborative process. Furthermore, while Piaget's theory suggested that development has an end point, birth to adolescence, Vygotsky viewed development as beginning at birth and continuing until death. Vygotsky and Piaget had differing theories due to their differing values. Piaget valued mutual respect and social relationships among equal peers, whereas Vygotsky valued unilateral respect and authority-based relationships. Although Vygotsky's theory is fairly compelling, it is not without its weaknesses. One such weakness is that the zone can't tell us everything regarding the child. It doesn't provide an accurate picture of their learning ability, their style of learning, or current level of development compared to other children of the same age and degree of motivation. Essentially, we are only getting half of the story. The theory also suffers from the fact that we do not have a specific unit of measurement for these zones. Vygotsky would measure in years. However, this is a very global metric, and it cannot be assumed that the difference of three years between ages two and five 
is equal to that between ages 6 and 9. A final issue regarding the zone is the question of does it change over time. A large problem with this theory is simply that the zone is too vague. There are, however, two other weaknesses of the theory. First, it needs a more developmental account of both context and children. This means that children can bring different aspects to the table at different times in their development, and his theory does not fully deal with that. The final issue is that is, there is no prototype for this theory. Vygotsky did not have a series of tests conducted to prove this, nor did he write how this should be applicated. This leads to it being only personally used. That is not to say that we are completely unable to apply it in certain situations. Oftentimes, we see educators employing some tactics which fit in with Vygotsky's theory. One example of this would be in a high school laboratory science class. A teacher might provide scaffolding by his first giving students detailed guides to carrying out experiments, then giving them brief outlines that they might use to structure experiments, and finally asking them to set up experiments entirely on their own, or having your students work in groups where at least one of them has a better grasp than the others. It is important to note that not everything can be taught with this method. Only instruction and activities that fall within the zone promote development and that practice of previously known skills and introduction of concepts that are too difficult and complex have little positive impact. Lev Vygotsky's theory has been, and continues to be, used in the home and classrooms today. This type of development stresses the use of scaffolding and the zone of proximal development. So the next time you are in your classroom assisting a child with his learning, you will be using Vygotsky's Cognitive Development Theory.